a little announcement. So for those who have not been to any of our programs before, my name is Lauren Obach. I'm the adult and teen services librarian and the children's librarian right now at the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. This is our final session of America's Civil War with Arthur Gottlieb. This is number seven. We really hope you've enjoyed this series. It was brought to you by the Monroe Historical Society and the Friends of the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. As you come in, your cameras are set to on, your microphones are set to off. You can also change the closed captioning option at any time. Again, we ask that questions go into the chat box, or if you do wanna ask a question using your microphone, if you could just get our attention first, because there is a delay between when you start speaking and when we can hear you. So if you get our attention, we'll make sure that everybody can hear your question. Before we start today's session, which is titled Reconstruction, we do have a special announcement to make, which is that Arthur will be coming back beginning March 2nd for a, it's probably going to be five session series. Originally it was four, but we just keep adding things on. <laughs> so at this point, it's probably going to be five lasting through the end of April. We're doing something a little bit different. We're gonna move away from the military history a little bit, and he's going to be speaking on the history and architecture of New York City. So March 2nd is going to feature Ellis Island. Then we'll move to the Grand Central Terminal, the New York City subways, the Brooklyn Bridge, and the Chrysler Building will be our final session. Now to introduce you to Arthur, who has always been so wonderful in being so flexible with what I choose, especially when I cannot make up my mind about what I want him to speak about. He's a local historian on the subjects of political and military history. He was a member of the US Coast Guard stationed in Long Island. He was the former professional curator and technical director of exhibits at the Intrepid. And he is currently a certified senior advisor and counselor where he offers pro bono services to veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. Welcome, Arthur. Thank you so much. How, how is everyone today? I hope you're feeling well. Uh, once again, I wanna thank you um, for joining us on our program. And for those of you who have been with me uh, through a number of these programs, it's a real privilege to have you uh, giving your time to me like this. It's a privilege. Thank you. So we've, we're on our last session of the Civil War, the American Civil War. Um, I titled it Reconstruction. Um, so this period of time takes us for where we left off, which was, you know, roughly the assassination of Abraham Lincoln to really the end of the 20th, uh, the end of the 19th century right up to the beginning of the 20th century. Now, usually these periods of time are marked um, from the end of the Civil War, 19, 1865, and then the real next era begins, um, not at the turn of the clock for the, uh, for the year 1900, but really you're running into the beginning of World War I. And so that block of time begins anew to a different era. So think about this the way I've always tried to think about it and shared with you the way to think about it is what would it be like to be a person during this time period that we're discussing? That's been the subject of our study. Uh, you've heard me say before, I think one of the, the mistakes of certain historical analyses is that we, we see things through the eyes of, of denizens of our current age, the year now uh, 2022. And if we try to go back and apply, you know, what is what we at least perceive to be obvious to us, um, it doesn't make so much sense going back and, and attributing that to people who lived 150, 200 years before us um, and, but that takes time, it takes patience, it takes, um, it takes empathy, it takes understanding, uh, especially when it's going to be in the service of our own attitudes, not to understand others, 
because we want to feel like we're in a different position. We're in a superior position. We're in a more enlightened opinion. Um, and a lot of people don't want to take the chance of seeing the other side of an issue because then that's going to mean it's going to take away some of your own power. Um, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, a man was 56 years old. And there were a lot of people who absolutely despised him. I mean, if you had, if you were a white southerner who was sympathetic to you know the southern cause of uh, of of the keeping slavery, etc. I mean Abraham Lincoln was a good person to focus your ire on, and in the one person of one John Wilkes Booth, he did focus his ire on him by shooting him in the back of the head at Ford's Theater. And I don't know if you know this, but he had said John Wilkes Booth at the time that he shot him, he had an announcement. And the announcement was sick semper tyrannis. I wonder if you know what that means. You know, I've got one of my more less presented presentations is one on the state flags of America, right? The state flags like you know, the Connecticut state flag, the New York state flag. In this case, Six Semper Tyrannus, the Virginia state flag. If you've ever seen the Virginia state flag, it very proudly shows a, a robed figure with its foot on basically a dead person, a slain person. And Six Semper Tyrannus means in Latin, of course, thus always to tyrants. And what this means is in the revolutionary war aspects of things is we were talking about the King of England and the notion of these monarchies and how they became tyrannical and were tyrannical by nature. And we are, and we are, not up with the tyrannical government, you see. So therefore the South felt as though in a constitutional sense that they were actually keeping what was the best thing about the American Revolution, which was we are not gonna, we are not gonna be ruled by tyrants. And uh, roughly speaking, when the United States government from Washington DC started issuing these decrees about who was going to be allowed to have states, uh, slaves in their states or not, that then was running up against the same sort of tyrannical behavior that we fought the revolution to get away from. And that's why John Wilkes Booth used that, six separate tyrannists. So Lincoln represented and deserved to be slain, obviously in Wilkes mind, in Wilkes Booth's mind, because he had become nothing but a modern version of King George. And, you know, so that right, that one little moment and what was said and the sentiment behind it speaks a lot about uh, what the many white Southerners felt about our centralized government or federal government. And uh, you can see also how, you know, some of this sentiment you know, literally carries on into other sorts of discussions about the 10th Amendment to the Constitution, which was essentially the federal balance with state rights versus um, centralized government rights and where those where that balance should be. So it's a very important point. Um, Wilkes Booth, he had not acted as part of a conspiracy. There are many um, stories, many histories. Uh, we've got this thing about conspiracies in our country. It always makes a better story to say that there was some kind of a massive conspiracy. There were other people who were supposed to be part of this thing with Wilkes Booth and they dropped out. Like one person was going to kill the vice president. The other person was going to kill the secretary of state, you know, and Seward actually did get hit and left for dead, you see, but it was John Wilkes Booth who took it upon himself to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. And he gave his life for it ultimately, as I suppose he expected it would cost him his life. 
Um, I saw something in the chat room just a moment ago. So let's have a look at it. Sure. You mentioned how the South in the beginning was afraid of losing power in Congress. How did the fugitive slave law pass in Congress and did they in fact lose power? How did the fugitive slave law what? Pass in Congress and did they in fact lose power in the South? Well, I'll tell you the, the Democrats in general lost power in Congress and the there was a, a tremendous amount of sympathy actually for the anti-slavery cause. It, it had built up quite a bit, even during the war. And I, this is something that I was gonna talk about in today's lecture. This question just prompted me to dive into it a little sooner than I was going to. The Democrats in Congress lost a tremendous amount of power when the South seceded from the Union. Right, and it had become like this um, identification of the brand new Republican Party to be the abolitionist party, and those for ironically, it's almost like opposite what sometimes is characterized as now, uh, where Democrats were aligned with Southern slaveholding states and segregationism, and yet the Republicans were you know, riding high, especially after the Civil War, because if you were Republican, it automatically meant that you were for kind of like what today we would refer to as human rights, you see. And when the Southern states actually came back into the Union after the Civil War and were readmitted, the Southern states actually had more power again, and so did the Democratic Party. You know, today the, the image of it is a little bit of inverted vis-a-vis -vis the two parties, you see. Um, I mean, and that lasted right up until, I mean, to a large effect, it lasted up until, I would say, you know, the presidency of Lyndon, of Frank, um, John F. Kennedy, okay, and how John F. Kennedy needed a, a white Southerner um, in the form of Lyndon Baines Johnson to secure the, what we usually refer to as the Dixiecrat vote, especially, especially not just because of the youth of John F. Kennedy and there were the, what might be perceived as the traditional values democratically of him, but, but especially because he was a Catholic, you see, and you needed to offset the Catholic thing because Catholic was, you know, persona non gratis in this country to a pretty high degree right after the Negro. Uh, you know, if you consider a good example would be if you study the history of, we're coming up on will be coming up on, you know, St. Patrick's Day, et cetera. You know, so there's, you might speak of Irish Americans. I mean, the only thing that was less on the totem pole socially and derogatorily uh, towards the bottom rung, which would have been the American Negro, would have been the Irish Catholic. And um, you know, it's just interesting how these things blend together like this and overlap each other. Um, Looking back from our particular vantage point now, and our particular vantage point now, knowing where we are at this moment, and I've got to actually explain that, okay, because I'm doing current events programs, which I call focus on contemporary issues um, all the time. And I talk about things that are in the news all the time. I've, I've give, given presentations on the 1619 Project and critical race theory, and, and uh, social justice, et cetera. And also as a licensed clinical social worker, I mean, I have to study and be tested on to keep my credentials, you know, all of these things that it is considered that the state of Connecticut wants me to know uh, to maintain my licensure. You know, so I'm pretty well up on what the current ideas of what social justice means in the form of many things like, um, restorative justice or reparations or intersectionality or all of the rest of these types of things, we could obviously do a seven part series on that. Um, but where we are right now in our country after specifically, you know, the murder, and you notice that I am using the word murder of George Floyd, because I think he was murdered. 
um, we are in a position where we're asking ourselves, well, what is our position today? I mean, are you and I uh, collectively sitting in a nation that is just inherently racist from the core and the constitution was inherently racist from the core and therefore the whole thing really needs to be tossed out and we have to start with something else? And what's the point of integrating different races when the what we're trying to integrate our race to uh, something that used to be called the melting pot isn't worth integrating to because it's inherently racist, you see? So we're just gonna start, start from scratch, right? This is kind of where we are right now. Um, there are people who feel like that stronger and there are people who feel like, you know, obviously in the other end of the political and ideological spectrum. So one of the things that comes up about the civil war for me, just on the, the first thing I'm thinking about is it's irreconcilable to think that today in the way I've described our current uh, perception of ourselves, if that's what it is, how do you reconcile that with the fact that the United States um, fought for at least what most of the North came to believe as the abolition of slavery in the American Civil War. You see, now these definitions aren't set either, but the legacy of the Civil War, particularly for the North, is that we fought a war, a noble war, for the eradication of something that was ungodly, which was chattel slavery, the ownership of other people and the enslavement of other people. And uh, so therefore, if the United States, well, let's see, the North with 2.2 million men roughly in service, and I'm just talking about military forces, um, out of 2.2 roughly million men in service in uniform for the Union forces, um, a minimum of 360,000 were killed in battle and another 275 were significantly wounded. All right, so the total casualty for that is 360,000 plus 275,000, not including civilian casualties. So I think that it would be a misnomer not to recognize that a significant effort was made on the part of the North to sacrifice the cream of its youth towards the abolition of slavery, you know, which makes it at least from this point incompatible with the notion that the United States is irredeemably racist and therefore not worth preserving in its original constitutional form. That's number one. Now, also the South um, put about 750,000 men in uniform, which relatively speaking was a very, very large number, you know, because the South had less people than the North did. And not only that, but with all of those men in uniform, then who was running the farms and the agricultural places. And that literally was what we were talking about in an earlier lecture where a lot of black slaves had to come forward and actually run the plantations and then take care of the duties, even of like what you, know, you might refer to as middle management of these plantations from the standpoint of what they knew was aiding the Southern effort to win, you see, which is a bit of a, you know, it doesn't really fit together why they would do that. But yet at the same time, you would have to put yourself, I mean, if you were a, on a plantation and you were a black slave, you'd have to ask yourself what you knew and what you didn't know and what it was worth fighting for from the standpoint of keeping yourself alive and your family together, you see. Um, we're oftentimes very unsympathetic today about anyone who was in an absolute 
activist who's willing to just um, die on a certain hill and, and not to be able to die on that certain hill marks you as somebody who's a phony or you don't care enough or that sort of a thing. Um, if you see what I'm getting at, you know, I mean, if you had a black family in a black plantation with all of your relatives around, et cetera, and at least the idea that freedom might be coming, I mean, would you rebel against everything around you which would probably result in your death, or if not the death of your family? Or would you just kind of like punt and wait it out? And then hopefully you'll receive what, you know, is usually referred to as emancipation, you see? Um, the South out of 750,000 in service lost a minimum of 260,000 in battle dead and also 200,000 wounded. Uh, and these numbers, of course, you know, nobody knows the actual numbers and this doesn't include civilians. And uh, so you've got roughly 620,000 dead between the Northern forces and the Southern forces. That is a very large sacrifice. Um, if you consider the amount of people that was lost by the United States of America in other conflicts, in other wars, even right up to the present day. Um, you know, uh, obviously our, um, our loss of, what was it, 12 soldiers it, just a few months back uh, in our withdrawal from Afghanistan is something that is, we, we are mourning um, the lives of these young men and women and uh, soldiers, sailors, and airmen, and Marines, uh, you know, back in the days of the Civil War, you're losing hundreds of thousands of people in one battle. Uh, so, you know, a little bit of context, but the Civil War was a seminal event in United States history. Now, as far as economies were concerned, as far as what was lost between the Southern states and the Northern states, I mean, the South, the South lost the war. And they lost as a result of the war from the standpoint of uh, politics, they lost the majority of their wealth because if you counted your wealth about the fact that you owned a thousand slaves and you had a plantation, well, maybe you still had the plantation when you were done, but you did not own the property of the slaves after the war. So another question is, do you count that as a monetary loss? Because you went into the Civil War with having X amount of slaves as on the ledger as something you owned and whatever value that was. And obviously by the end of the war, that was no longer the case. So that was taken right off the ledger as far as what a person may have owned. You know, and if you're like me, you're thinking, well, you know, too bad that they never should have been counted as property anyway. But that's just that uh, cheap shot from the, tw from the 21st century, you see. And, um, but the North increased its wealth by a very significant factor, right? The people in the North, especially if you owned a factory, you wound up with a with a boon of like a 60% increase in value of property and material wealth. And the Southern people, I mean, it was the opposite. It was the opposite. You know, which brings up another point that I want to just mention to you. If you consider something like the, um, uh, for want of a better term, the pandemic, that we've, that we've experienced over, what is it, three years now? Three years now, two and a half years? And if you consider, do you think that Amazon made money during the pandemic? All right, I mean, just to use a simple example, and I'm not saying that from a resentful position or a, I don't mean it to take a shot, uh, but you know, just like any situation, it's, it's, re, it's remarkable that despite how technology changes, some still very basic things still maintain uh, their sureness over generations. 
right? Uh, some of the commentary, I did a big program on Monday morning about the potentiality for war in Ukraine. And I talked about from both sides of the political spectrum what some of the criticisms are of, of some of the motivations involved, you know, and you had Eisenhower talking about the great industrial military complex and how there was a propensity, right? This is Eisenhower. I'm talking about when Eisenhower went out of office and during his, his, um, his last speech that he gave. Right, he's talking about beware of this industrial military complex because they'll be seeking conflict, you know, because you want to keep the bomb factories going and the research money flowing in and the profits flowing in. And um, during the Civil War, as it turns out, now I'm not saying this is evil, um, but I'm just making a point that the North, who had the preponderance of the factories, became rather wealthy. It's just kind of an ancillary point. And these things never seem to change over time. You see, and the South, their landscape was devastated. So if you and I were managed to survive the war and we actually were Southerners, you and I were Southerners, and we were surveying our county, that might've been in Tennessee, it might've been, around Atlanta, it might have been someplace in Virginia, we would be looking at our once beautiful, I mean, beautiful landscape of farms, barns, small towns, churches, municipal houses, um, stables of horses, and it would be gone, essentially burned to the ground, all of the wood that was in all of the beautiful fences, the wood was all used for firewood or to build things. Uh, it was all gone. It was all gone. Everything was a hollowed out shell of itself. The livestock was gone. The crops were gone. People were in a state of shock, essentially. An entire civilization was gone. What would you and I be saying to each other? Right? We would be saying, well, gee, that was a stupid idea. We never should have fought the North. No, that's not what people do. You know that. We would be saying, we would be finding ways to rationalize why somehow why we fought was noble and somehow better than the forces that defeated us because we were defeated. And that's what leads to, in retrospect, these two big camps of understanding retrospectively about what the war was about, what the war meant, right? Now, just like anything else, he who wins, and forgive my male pronouns with that, I'm, I'm old and I'm stuck in a couple of these things, right? He who wins writes the history, you see? And that's as true to, to this moment as it ever was. And he who wins, he who controls, you know, the mechanisms of the power of the pen and the distribution of information wins because you literally can um, uh, write the history and you can certainly propagandize the truth to spin things. And this became very, very early at the end of the Civil War, I sent you that bibliography out. And a lot of those things were actually written after the war, looking back. Now, most of them are of a military nature, you see. But, you know, and remember, I look at things uh, as I do from the standpoint of sociology and psychology quite a bit, in addition to the, um, in addition to the, uh, the military aspects of things. And because I am, you know, a, a licensed clinical social worker and I see things in sociological trends and terms and motivations of behavior about what people need to tell themselves for various reasons, okay? And I don't mean to cast that upon other people. I mean, if you wanna have somebody who, who has to find reasons why he just did something that might've been actually stupid, I mean, look, look I, I offer myself as exhibit A, right? So I'm, I try to be very humble about these things. And so you've gotta find a way to make it seem as though 
this whole thing wasn't in vain. And wh why did you sacrifice the entire lifestyle and the lifestyle and the legacy of your children? What was it for? Because you lost. Do you turn around and say, like I in, in implied before, well, that was a stupid idea. Okay, we'll just do it the way the North does it now. And, you know, because three weeks earlier, I despised the North and everything they stood for. And I had made it clear to myself why I was fighting, why we were superior, why our style of life was superior to that of the North, and why everything that the North believed in was wrong, and why we believed in was right. You know, that just doesn't go away. And that led to literally generations of books being written uh, about those things, right? About why the South lost. And why the North won. You see, now that sounded a little elementary, right? Why the South, South lost, why the North won. But they're really two different things. Why the South lost is not the same thing as why the North won. Uh, that sounds, uh, Art, what are you talking about? The South came up with this idea called the myth of the lost cause. Right, and that was their spin on this whole thing. And the spin, the spin was that the South had taken the noble high ground by really being the guarantors of what our original founding fathers, right? I mean, you know, Lincoln, Jefferson, Monroe, um, everybody, what they tried to incorporate in the founding of our country, which was um, what John Wilkes Booth was referencing in his own uh, murderous way by saying six semper tyrannis, right? So if the notion of the beginning of our country was that we are going to have our freedom and we are not going to have a federal government tell everyone in the whole country on the whim of the federal government what everybody in the whole country needs to do. That is not what this country was founded on. You see, so anyway, this is the basis of the noble cause that we, the Southern states are really standing up to the oppressive federal government by demanding that our rights our 10th amendment guaranteed to us in the Bill of Rights is going to be upheld. And they carefully in the great, the lost cause, they scrub out the notion of that this was about the preservation of slavery for the South. They scrub it out, you see. So this is their propaganda. Um, if you were to go four years earlier and say, what's the war about? You may very well have the same person who is now spinning, as we would say currently. They would say, well, you know, they can't take our slaves away. We have a right to hold slaves and they're not taking our slaves away, right? But people who understood that to preserve the honor and the integrity of the South and that cause as a glorious cause had to find a way to spin it so that it would be palatable in a post-war country. And you had to scrub the part about wanting to keep slaves about why the South seceded from the Union. You had to scrub that. It literally had to be removed, you know? And they had a lot of people in the North even were sympathetic with this because the, the, the unique thing about the American Civil War, as far as wars go, is that technically speaking, we were fighting each other ourselves. You know, I mean, it's not like, you know, you're sending soldiers over to Nazi Germany to fight Nazis, you see. I mean, the people we were fighting I mean, maybe it's your cousin. Maybe, it, I mean, what if you had a family that one of them moved south and you were in a northern state? You would literally be fighting your cousin, 
You see, so we, we had the same ideology, technically speaking, we had the same roots of Americanism. Uh, we had the same kind of patriotic fervor to the, to the Constitution of the United States, right? But we ran into our first constitutional crisis about when we were gonna be moving our newly formed territories and states out West, whether or not they were gonna be slaveholding states or not. So we had a first constitutional crisis. But the thing is, is that after the war, and if you look to somebody like Lincoln, Lincoln, as I remember, as I, as I told you earlier, Lincoln said that if I could keep the union together without freeing one slave, I would do it. You see? And even though most of the people in the North, right, like I didn't take a personal survey, but nobody really knows these things. But from what I've read, the sentiment was that the average Union soldier did not join the, the cause for the freedom of, or the emancipation, better put, of slaves. They did it to preserve the Union. And there was this prevailing feeling literally since the beginning of our country, I'm talking about pre-Civil War, that slavery was something that was untenable and was literally going to wither on the vine if you gave it enough time, you see? So during the war with the Emancipation Proclamation, it had taken a different tone. And it was a moral rallying cry for many that, yes, it is a noble thing to do to emancipate slaves now and do that which many people at the founding of our country felt should have been done from begin with. I remind you that our original compromise, a fatal compromise of the Declaration of Independence, right, which should have been the point where if you're gonna come out and say something like all men are created equal, now would be a good time to say we're gonna abolish slavery, right? And it is true that Thomas Jefferson actually recognized that massive contradiction and included in the original draft of the Declaration of Independence, a clause eradicating slavery, which had to be removed by the people who edited the document. The Declaration of Independence, because it was a compromise. Therefore, it is understood that the Southern states will not sign this document creating the Declaration of Independence and declaring our independence from Great Britain. And it would be better to declare our independence from Great Britain and have our own country and then deal with the inevitable issue of slavery next. So that was taken out. And well, like I told you, by 1820, only you know, 40, 45 years after things like the Constitution, we already had the beginnings of our second constitutional crisis, which was literally the fact that it was based in the first constitutional crisis, right? Which was, well, not a constitutional crisis, but the but the but the inherent contradiction in the uh, Declaration of Independence that we didn't eradicate slavery right then and there. You see, so the noble cause, the myth of the lost cause, took the Southern states and gave them the ability to become Americans again, or part of the union again, because they actually never weren't Americans, all right? And it was able to do it by maintaining their honor, by scrubbing the, we want to have slaves part out of it, and saying that the only reason why the South lost was that we were faced, we the Southern Southerners were faced by this greedy, mechanized, industrial society that believed in nothing and stood for nothing and overwhelmed us with their, their monetary superiority that was based in greed, 
and um, and they were able to build more stuff that we couldn't possibly have ever conquered, right? That we could never have won. So it's not like General Lee actually lost the battle. It was that really Lee um, ran out of material in contrast to the overwhelming superiority of the less virtuous North. That is the myth of the lost cause. You see, and you know, dozens of books were written in this light, in this light. You know, we look at this now and we, we look back from the year 2022 to 2021 to 2020, and we look back and we say, you know, was the South really ever going to admit that slavery was wrong? And this is very, very important. Because the North wanted to readmit the South so rapidly back into the Union, it became necessary to kind of like sugarcoat this thing about that this, the reason why the Southern states were fighting was because they wanted to keep slaves, right? And all of the social things that go with thinking that one class of people or one race is better or superior to the other, like let alone own another race, you see? So the notion here in reconstruction during this period of time was because to be able to put the country back together, you had to get on board a little bit with the myth of the lost cause, which downplayed slavery and maintain and give the Southern states the ability to still have their honor even in defeat. Today, we look back and we say, are we complicit and never saying that slavery was wrong? You see, so we fought the Civil War. We lost all of these hundreds of thousands of people, but in the course of reconstruction, which was still a period of time, even though you have now uh, constitutionally abolished slavery, we're still a lot of racism involved, right? Still a lot of racism involved. You know, people felt that they were better than these people. Protestants felt that they were better than these people. White people felt that they were better than these people. Men felt that they were better than women. I mean, all kinds of things, you see, all together, right? And then, so we tried to put this country together to have some kind of a status quo. And then later on now you have this situation where the question is being asked in our current period of time was, would we ever really deal with the notion that slavery was bad? You see, and that's, I was, I was alluding to that a moment ago by saying, if you look at the fact that the Civil War was fought and you look at the fact that by the end of the war, the majority of Northerners felt that it really was about the abolition of slavery, then how can you say that we never really addressed the issue of slavery? But because in Reconstruction, we had to tone it down, we got on board with the Southerners to a certain degree in toning down the racial thing so that the Southern states could be honorably reincorporated into the North, even though obviously slavery is now illegal, if not still in practice by Jim Crow. We're looking at it today and asking the question, and it's a plausible question, did we ever really address the issue as it should have been of slavery? You see, so that's you know the paradigm we wind up in. And, and if you look at people who don't study history, um, then you know you look back on it and you say, well, no, we've never dealt with it. And it becomes very, very easy to say that. So therefore, it's incumbent upon me in the year 2020 to take it upon myself to actually act uh, to to be an activist towards this cause because the country never really dealt with slavery. You see, um, it depends on what's being taught and, and the context of, of how it's being taught. Now, this is a very difficult thing. Ask yourself, even as a northerner, 
how you incorporate the Southern states. This was a very, very dicey thing. You know, I did a program on, um, um, back on uh, in December in a number of my locations called the Christmas Truce of 1914. And what that was about, it was about the Germans and the British on the Western Front in World War I. And, and basically, you know, you want to talk about carnage, you know, so you have these trench lines on both sides and some place thing called no man's land in the beginning. And in the first year of the war, 1914, is where this Christmas truce occurred. So uh, even though people are like murdering each other by the hundreds of thousands on a regular basis here in various battles in World War I, you know, at the beginning of, in 1914, the first year of the war, there was still a lot of commonality between the German soldiers and the British soldiers. Right. I mean, the average German soldier and the average British soldier didn't really know what the hell what this was all about. I mean, that was for the politicians and that was for the generals and all the rest of that. And the English, a lot of their cousins were still over in Germany and vice versa, you know. So the Germans spoke English or French, the English spoke French or German, and these people had a common heritage. Uh, from an Anglo-Saxon standpoint of Christianity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so when uh, on the other side of the trenches on December 24th, you hear, you know, Silent Night being sung in German, everybody over on the English side of, this, uh, of the trench know what song it is and have the same sentiment that the Germans do, even though it's being sung in a different language. And people uh, during this time, they got out of their trenches, you know, albeit cautiously. And they actually, for you know, various in various places along the line, they took a little holiday from the war. They exchanged toffee and other gifts. Photographs were taken, and and this sort of thing. And then you know, the next day they literally went back to slaughtering each other. You see, but my point is that this could have only happened in the first war, or the first year of the war. Three years later. In 1917, this never would have happened, never ever, because it didn't matter what you had in common. So many of your friends had been murdered and battle, killed in battle, and so much carnage has occurred that they are now your mortal enemy, just in general. And that's the way it was in the Civil War. And by the end of the Civil War, this notion like, well, we're all Americans and all the rest of that, you know, that kind of rang hollow. I mean, that would be a good, an easy thing for a politician to say, but for you, right? Whose, whose homestead was raised to the ground and everything you owned was gone and everything you believed in and thought was right and godly has been defaced and defiled. You're not forgiving that so fast. So reconstruction was a very dicey notion. Now, one of the things that, remember the conspiracy theories I was telling you about, about Lincoln? One of the conspiracy theories was that it was actually a, um, a, a bunch of Northern people that murdered Lincoln. Well, why would Northern people murder Lincoln? I mean, didn't we win the Civil War? No, it's because Lincoln, was very plain about the way he wanted to have favorable terms to all of the states that had seceded from the Union. You see, because there were a lot of people, a lot of Northerners, and this was traditional in warfare, by the way, it was a European tradition to be brutal towards those who had lost. I mean, you come in and you own everything. And, and, and these people are basically like, you know, uh, your indentured servants now. I mean, you own the economy, you own the land, you own everything, just, be, just from the fact that you won, right? So it's to the victor goes all, and to the vanquished goes nothing, you see? And a lot of people felt that way. And they were afraid that because the South had committed the ultimate heresy, by, by seceding from the union, that they should pay the price in like these heavy reparations and humiliation, frankly. Lincoln did not feel that way. Lincoln wanted to offer generous terms to the South 
in order to bring them back into, to dovetail them back into the union society as rapidly as possible, and maybe a little bit naively, uh, kind of like as if nothing happened, you see? So the conspiracy theory is that you have these people in the North who were afraid that if Lincoln were to live, that he actually were gonna to be too easy on the Southern states, which really ought to be punished. So if we kill Lincoln, that's not gonna happen. As so it turns out, that's just a conspiracy theory. But the reason I tell you this is because it was a sentiment of the day. And this actually lasted, this kind of thinking lasted uh, uh, probably the best example of it, it would be the end of World War I. I told you that this was a, especially a European tradition. And in World War I, at the end of World War I, right, the French particularly were brutal in their terms of surrender to the Germans, where the Germans had to pay, had to give up all of this land, and they had to give up all of these resources, and they had to sign on to all of these conditions that was going to enrage the Germans. And essentially created a, a immediately created a, a generation that that was ripe for World War II just to get revenge on the humiliation that the French handed the Germans at the end of World War I. You see, um, the Treaty of Versailles. I'll be happy to do something on that for you to explain this further if you want. But uh, Lincoln wanted to get these states, the southern states back into the union as fast as possible and as most honorably as possible, right? And that wasn't easy to do. Now, when Lincoln was assassinated, this created a, wa a wave, a tidal wave of anti-Confederate sentiment. Now the war was over, but anybody who had had any goodwill towards the Southern states and was leaning towards Lincoln's uh, policy of going easy on the Southern states to readmit them to the Union, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. After Lincoln's assassination, there were people who blamed the Confederacy, right? They blame the Confederacy and they say, now we have to have our revenge. Uh, and we should be brutal and we should send all these carpetbaggers down into the South and just literally exploit everything, you see? And uh, that happened anyway. But you see how the assassination of Lincoln actually put this whole reconciliation thing in, uh, on the back burner because people were very angry over the assassination of Lincoln. Now, Towards the last two decades of the 20th century, right, from 1880-ish onward, um, particularly, there was an overt effort, an overt effort, particularly by Southern states and the widows of Southern uh, officers and soldiers, Right, but particularly officers, because you know it's still a class society, and the people with the juice are still the people at the top, right? So, to have all of these these um, veterans associations, etc., and to have the Southern soldiers be honored in a way that was not just for the Confederate States of America but as Americans, you see, so this creates this next level of animosity where, and, and, it, and it hits it head on. And the way that gets head on hit, head on hit, hit head on is, is in this regard of the war dead. You see, think about, think about it this way. If you know the, the history of Arlington Cemetery, right, Arlington. Now, Arlington belonged actually to uh, Custis, which was Lee's wife's family, right? And it's this still build, big building with the columns, et cetera, in Arlington, if you've ever been there. And it's like literally overlooking Washington, right? So at the beginning of the war, it became, it, it, it made sense 
to grab Arlington and all of the land surrounding it, and this big plantation, right? Uh, because you don't want to give the Confederates literally the high ground over Washington, which I'm sure that they would have been glad to use, right? For military or reconnaissance purposes, whatever, you see? So it became a point actually to grab Arlington. Now, uh, and then, you know, you have so many dead soldiers that it was decided to have a, a national cemetery, which at that moment meant a union cemetery. Uh, you know, and you, I'll leave the irony for you to uh, determine about taking Lee's estate and turning it into the major federal burial place for union soldiers. Okay, but anyway, that's what happened, right? Now, during this period of time, post-Civil War, um, Civil War veterans were not allowed to be interned at Arlington. You see, so you still had this segregation, right? And they were Civil War cemeteries. But so this notion of, well, Arlington is like, well, we're not going to put Civil War, so I mean, rather Confederate soldiers here. That's going to deface the memory of the Union soldiers that were fighting the Confederates for this noble cause. You see, so this is another issue. Now, I'm using this because it actually illustrates the point pretty well. So what do you do with all of these Confederate soldiers that after 25 years of the federal government after the Civil War saying, everybody's reincorporated back into the American family. And just because you were part of a Southern state that had seceded from the Union, now you're not considered a, um, you know, anti-government or something. And you're an American just like somebody who lives in Connecticut. So if that is truly the case, then why can't my brother, my father, my uncle, my husband be buried in the American National Cemetery? You see what I'm getting at? And it created this whole other angst about, I mean, and the people who were the um, in charge of Arlington, they were like, we're not going to do that. What are you, crazy? But anyway, enough political pressure came to bear by these groups of veterans, these Confederate veterans groups, mainly made up of the, uh, the widows of these dead officers and soldiers that Confederate soldiers actually started to become incorporated into Arlington, right? But they were still different because the Confederate soldiers, the shapes of their tombstone are different than the Union soldiers, right? To depict, you know, you have to, you can't just, you can't just make it equal, right? Not to say that a different shape evokes you know, one being higher than the other, but there is a differentiation, you see? And then, and then you had situations like this. So now that you've got Confederate soldiers and you've got Union soldiers at Arlington, right? And then you had situations where it was like Christmas time. And now we have something called Wreaths Around America, which is something that's kind of like a, you know, a more of a modern thing. Uh, I'll tell you the story of that at the time, but it was, the, it was the custom to decorate graves, right? Of course, you have Decoration Day, right? We can Google that if you want to. And the thing is, is that when it was the federal government's responsibly, responsibility and they would go around and put flags or whatever it was or little wreaths, they would not put wreaths on any of the Confederate soldiers' graves. You see, so once again, it is separate but equal, right? So now it's like, okay, all Confederates who fought in the Civil War are equal to every other American and they're welcomed back into the fabric of America. But don't tell me that we're gonna honor them in the same way we're gonna honor Union soldiers, you see? It's an interesting little dilemma, isn't it? What do you do? And then, 
The biggest story of all in all of this is these uh, veterans groups, et cetera, uh, on the part of the Confederate dead, they actually had a lot of sympathy in the federal government once the reign of republicanism in Washington waned. You see, uh, the Republicans were kind of riding this wave of, I don't know, righteousness after the Civil War. Because as I said to you earlier, republicanism was kind of like synonymous with emancipation, right? But this had died down by like 1900-ish. And when um, Wilson became president, a Democrat, often considered our first real progressive president in, in, the, in, the, in the kind of a modern definition of progressivism, right? Um, Wilson, the Democrat, almost to the stereotype, as I was telling you before, was very sympathetic to the Southern cause. And you know that Wilson was an avid segregationist and an avid racist, right? Not any room for opinion here, okay? Uh, the White House itself and the government to some degree had literally become um, dis segregated, unsegregated. Uh, and when Wilson came back in, he immediately resegregated everything. You see? So the Democratic president came in, Wilson comes in, and he's a segregationist, right? Kind of like separate but, um, separate but equal. You know, it's, it's not, it's separate but not really equal. And, and the thing is, is that the, these veterans groups, the Southern veterans groups, the Confederate veterans groups had proposed to the federal government and it was approved to have an entire area of Arlington Cemetery dedicated to solely Confederate dead, you see? And this was a big political ruckus. So now for the first time, Confederate dead from wherever they fell and wherever there was a little cemetery, for the first time, if you were a Confederate soldier or the family of a Confederate soldier, you can have your loved one disinterred from whatever hill that there was a makeshift grave and they can be the remains shipped to our national cemetery where the Confederate soldier could be interned as an American soldier, technically speaking, with the same honors as any Union soldier. And the Confederate organization spent an awful lot of money finding a very, very um, uh, sympathetic um, sculptor and designer, they had to go to Europe to do it, to create this very, very large monument about the honor and the sacrifice of the Southern cause that revolved around this notion of the myth of the lost cause. And it is there in Arlington. Um, and there is this kind of like these concentric rows that come out from this monument of the Confederate dead. And um, it's very, very fascinating to look at. I almost took, I have a slideshow on it. I almost took it and was gonna include it in this, but you know, I, I didn't wanna hijack it with that. And, but if you look at the imagery around this, this monument, which by the way, was dedicated personally by President Wilson, you see? So it was President Wilson who took the Confederates and brought them right up to front and center stage in the American public as an equal to anything else that's American, right? Um, the imagery around this statue, or monument really, is, is very, very sympathetic and very noble and very honorable to the Southern cause, right? Showing like 
you know, black slaves uh, being equally as remorseful to see their, I guess, master, who's now a soldier, go off to battle. And they're just hoping for his return and for everything to get back to normal as the guy's wife was or family was, right? It's fascinating to look at the imagery around this monument. And um, so you can see how there was this pull and tug about whether or not all of these Southerners were really belonged in the same cemetery as Union soldiers. Right, and which culminated in this event of the um, the Confederate part of Arlington National Cemetery. You see, um, so if the South lost, they lost for reasons that were noble. The South was noble. They fought the good fight, and they lost to the North, which was ignoble and rooted in materialist capitalist greed where money was king and finally defeated the noble, honorable, heartfelt South. So this is the way stories are written one way or the other, you know, but by our time today, uh, for reasons why I alluded to earlier, we look back at this period of time and we say that anything that has to do with the Southern cause is, is, needs to be essentially eradicated because any sympathy towards it means that you must feel the same as the South, the South did. So in other words, if you wanna leave a statue of Robert E. Lee in Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, then that must mean that you're sympathetic to the Southern cause uh, and that automatically means that you actually think that black people should be slaves. You see, so today we have this like zero tolerance for any, you know, what is this about from both sides thing? You see, uh, it is if you are sympathetic to a Robert E. Lee statue, uh, that means that you're obviously a racist, period. And that's the end of discussion and said statue comes down and the base comes down and there's no trace of it anymore. You see, so, and that is kind of an interesting contrast and that is the latest manifestation of a direct line straight from these periods of time that I'm talking about. Now, by the time that um, the Spanish-American War rolled around in 1898, um, and then especially uh, and I had mentioned this in an earlier lecture, especially by World War I, you had now the United States of America, the Southern states, the Northern states, the New Western states, the Midwestern states, all fighting in, you know, getting on some ship and going off to France as part of the American Expeditionary Force. And it served as a bonding thing because you were fighting the other. You see, anytime you're fighting the other, in this case, the Germans, then that means that it forces you or it's likely that you might consider the commonalities that you have that are gonna bridge any differences that you have. And that is certainly the case when it comes to people who are you know, the relatives of people who fought in the Civil War or relatives of those who fought in the North. Right? Because don't forget, by World War I, if you're in World War I, and let's say, for instance, you're 20 years old, right? that means you were, built, you were born in, what, 1895? I mean, probably your father was the guy who fought in the Civil War, or certainly your uncle, or somebody like that. Now, that's pretty damn close, you see? So if you're that kind of proximity generationally, I mean, that means that you're standing next to somebody in some boat somewhere on some ship, and you've got, let's say, for instance, a Yankee accent, and the guy next to you, let's say, has a Southern accent, you don't think that there's going to be, it's not going to be like, hey, how are you doing? You know, my dad really kicked your ass back in Chancellorsville, didn't he? You know, it's not going to be any of that. There's still going to be this tension. This tension, this unresolved, I can't believe we lost to you, right? Or you deserve to get beaten. 
You see, and another thing that goes with this that I should describe to you sociologically, since it has so much to do with the landscape of, of um, the post George Floyd um, way of thinking of social justice, you know, and I'll use the terms in uh, from the social justice wars or, or discussions to make this clear. There is something called white privilege, which you are, I'm sure, familiar with, which means that if you're a white person, you're thinking, well, what's the big deal? You know, there's no racism. I don't see any racism. I mean, I see people, I went to Harvard and there were black people in Harvard or this, that or the other thing. The answer to that would be, well, you don't see it because you're white. So you have this privileged life where you don't have to consider what are the, and I'll use this term because they use this term, microaggressions of daily life that is representative of the vestigial racism in our society, endemic in our society, see? And the reason I bring this up, if you wanna parallel that to what it meant for those two guys, my hypothetical guys on the troop transport on the way to uh, France, in World War One, the northern guy would be like, hey, you know, I'm from whatever, New York, Connecticut, Maine, you see, Ohio, you see, and make no deal about no big deal about it. Hey, the Civil War was a long time ago. But the thing that you're missing and the parallel to the white privilege part and the blindness about it is that the southerner, even though he might also be white and he might also be Protestant, He's the defeated and suffers the ignominy of the defeated and suffers the generational shame that has been left over from the loss of the Civil War that he carries in the same parallel sense that the person who, even though as a Black person or a person of color may say today, well, although I might not have suffered personal slavery or bondage, I carry the wounds of previous generations. See, so the thing is with the Southerner, even the white Protestant Southerner, right? They would be carrying the wounds and the shame of this, this inglorious defeat. And the, the winners, those from the North would be like, hey, what's the big deal? You know, we're all Americans now. And they would never understand the way the Southerner would see it. So the way that these things, I mean, in the last couple of years, we had a lot of, you know, I mean, anybody who was a Civil War general or anything like that, or these officers. So, you know, from my standpoint, you know, when I'm looking at the officers, the, the, uh, the Confederate officers, I mean, looking at it from a military standpoint, I'm looking at it in the context of the Civil War to say, was he a good officer? I mean, if this guy had gone left with his horse instead of right, would it have made a difference? You know, but you can't take away from the fact that everyone who was fighting for the Confederacy technically was fighting for the cause that they were fighting for. You know, so whether or not we were, were all of these tearing downs of statues, et cetera, has thrown the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, I'll leave it to I'll, I'm going to leave that to you to decide. Um, but we are in a zero tolerance environment where if you even want to consider. Uh, somebody like a General Lee or I mean, even though General Lee you see, one of the ironies about Lee specifically, since I brought him up, and he was the most recent example of a statue being taken down. And that is, if you're not referring to Teddy Roosevelt, that remember that statue that was in front of the, what was it, Museum of Natural History, I think? Um, the thing is with Lee is that he was an avid supporter of reconstruction and moving on after the Civil War. He did a lot to take the defeated Confederate states and try to help reintegrate them, you know, back into the into the North, the victorious uh, Union, you know. But that is insignificant compared to the fact that he was representative of the Southern cause, which automatically makes him cause for immediate dismissal. Period. Uh, you know, from a historian standpoint, I think it's short-sighted. 
Um, I'm not making excuses for Lee or what he believed in, you know, and in this revisionist history, the spin that I was trying to tell you about earlier to promote the myth of the lost cause, it is true also that um, people like Lee were scrubbed of their, you know, the fact that they were, you know, he wasn't for the abolition of slavery. You know, he had no problem with it, you see? You know, but I do a lot of, uh, a lot of programs on military history. I did the Battle of the Bulge the other day, which is obviously a story not from the Civil War, um, but from the December of 1944 into January of 1945. And I'd be the first one to tell you that um, General Eisenhower was no fan of uh, the, the um, integration of the United States military either. He had no problem with the blacks being part of the black parts of the service and the whites maintaining this part of the white service. He thought that it you know, created greater harmony. Right. What it, whether or not that automatically makes him a racist. I mean, by today's definition, I, I, I think that I would have to say it does, you see. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's very, very thick waters that we that we paddle through here uh, and we are deep in it. We're deep in it. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to see with the. Um, roughly 12 minutes that we have left in our program uh, and see what other kind of discussion we can have. I hope I'll be able to answer your question. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to turn off the recording at this point. If anybody would like to turn their camera and their microphone on and ask a question,